Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. Before we start, I want to thank everyone who has supported the show, and in particular those of you who have contributed to the PayPal tip jar. Of course, the likes, subscribes, and shares help a great deal as well. I enjoy bringing you this content, and the contributions help cover the expenses for doing so. I've had a wonderful time chatting with the people on these shows, so much so that I would like to have them back for further conversations. As you listen, if there are any questions or topics you would like to hear us discuss, please post up a note in the comments or send me them directly. I'll pick the best ones and we'll cover them in future episodes. Another way you can get more content is to join the Spirit Aikido online program. There are currently more than 130 videos in the program, with new ones being added every few days. Subscribers get access to video training and mentoring to techniques and training methods that I've adopted from other martial arts to make my Aikido more practical. In the most recent series of videos, I cover weaponizing a couple of standard Aikido techniques, as well as a couple of good backup techniques for when your initial technique didn't go as planned. There's a link to the program in the description. I invite you to check it out. Now, on with the discussion. Well, I want to welcome Philip Greenwood Sensei uh, from California here to Modern Aikido's podcast. Uh, we want to have a, a little discussion today on Shoji Nishio Shihan and his influence with Aikido. But so welcome to the show. Thank you. Very cool. Uh, is there anything you Thank wanted you to, to say before you got started? You're in California, is that correct? We're in California. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we've all been going through some of the struggles of, you know, recently being in and out of training and, uh, you know, trying to maybe train solo or distance training and all these things. So I know we're all kind of in the same same boat here together with the same frustrations. And so, you know, my heart goes out to my brothers in Aikido out there, people that I know, people that I don't know, uh, most people that I don't know. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we can we can get back to the thing we love uh, sooner than later. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and share my experience in terms of what I know about uh, Nisho Sensei and uh, his perspective uh, on Aikido. So uh, do you have anything you were anywhere we're going to start with this or how do you want to? Well, you sure. You know, we uh, for those who are listening, uh, usually with a guest, I'll have a short conversation to set up the show, like covering some of the topics we want to talk about. And even just in those few minutes uh, where we started discussing uh, what I shared with with uh, Philip here was that I've heard of Nishio uh, Shi. I believe he's a Shihan, correct? Or Sensei? I'm not sure of his That's title exactly. I think a, it was Shihan. He was one of the uh, one of the uh, first in the post war. He started in 1951, mm -hmm. so he was one of the early post war uh, Aikido Shihan at Hambu. Sure. And uh, but he seems to be kind of a, a quiet figure. He he. When you look around, there's not a lot of material on what what his contributions to Aikido were. His perspectives. Uh, Aikido Journal does have some videos of demonstrations that he did. I think with the uh, was it an was it an Aiki Expo or was it a there was some sort of a collaborative uh, presentation type thing that happened back in the back in the day and yeah. I, I want to say it was 80s sometime it was in the, yeah some some was shot in the said there are a number of different uh, mm -hmm. video training and seminars that are are available and also his uh, the teaching videos that he did um, and with Stan Pran and mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I think Stan really encouraged him a lot even with his book, uh, to produce that because Nishio Sensei was always a little reluctant to kind of, I don't know, solidify what his teaching curriculum was. He was really evolutionary. Mm -hmm. uh, so he never wanted to kind of nail it down and, and say, this is the way that it's supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, from year to year, things would be evolving and, and changing in subtle ways. And uh, I think the more important thing that we get from Nishio Sensei is not necessarily how to do things, but rather a kind of logical approach to how Aikido can evolve going forward. Mm -hmm. If uh, I think uh, um, there is a, uh, um, a, a really interesting um, comment that was made by Alice Ander on Aiki Web 
what he uh, he has a little series on uh, you had to you had to feel it or what what is that little series he did on there? Yeah, he I talks think about that sounds right. It had, it had to be felt. It had to be felt. That's and right. He, and he has quite a long statement um, that I don't have anywhere in front of me right now on Nishio Sensei, but basically he talks about how Saito Sensei included. Um, certain representative things within his own volumes of, of, of books. And a lot of us were exposed to those early on in Aikido. I know I started in the 70s. And so there wasn't a lot of written material at that time, but Saito came out with these volumes and a lot of us in California were super exposed to, to Saito's teaching. So that became really influential. But Amber Sensei points out that in Saito's books, he has only very few other senseis represented there. He has Nidai Doshu, uh, Kishamaru Ueshiba, mm -hmm. obviously O Sensei. And then he features also a, a, a whole page photo of Nishio Sensei. Mm -hmm. And through various conversations uh, that Andrew Sensei had had with other teachers, he felt that um, Saito Sensei was sort of seen as the preserver of Aikido and the way that he learned it from O Sensei. Mm -hmm. And I think that's generally, generally accepted. And he saw himself in that way. Uh, but that on the other end of the spectrum, that Nisho Sensei was seen as being uh, represented of the Aikido of the future. Mm -hmm. um, Nisho Sensei came into Aikido already having significant experience in karate and judo. And so he came to, to Aikido um, already as a, as a fairly accomplished martial artist. Mm -hmm. So had a somewhat different view of, of things than maybe somebody who just started who hadn't had any experience. All right. And that before. was common at the time, as I understand it, from pre-war through slightly post-war, a, a, a vast majority of the people that came to a sensei already did have some uh, martial art experience, whether it was sumo or judo or uh, some of those things. I, I haven't heard too many accounts, and I'm, but I'm sure there are some of them of people that came to him with no martial background whatsoever. Um, but a number of the seniors were, were, were so impressed that, you know, they left their art to go, to go study under him. Yeah, the sense that I get was that a lot of them were um, sort of approaching it more from, not so much from technical answers, but more from the point of view of looking for philosophical and sort of more existential answers in their mm -hmm. martial art training that weren't necessarily being satisfied. Um, Nisho Sensei tells a lot of stories along the lines of, uh, oh, there was a case uh, where there was a very top ranking uh, judo instructor at the time who had had his house broken into uh, um, many, you know, or, or, and, and that, that, or, or that there was, a, there was, there were break-ins going on around there. And, and this judo instructor said, oh, if he, this guy breaks into my house, you know, I'll, I'll break him. And it was sort of this, this feeling of, uh, of, you know, uh, wanting to hurt this person. And then, uh, Nisho Sensei sort of goes into this story about, uh, Koichi Tohei Sensei. I don't know if you, are you familiar with that story that he tells about when uh, Tohei Sensei had his jacket stolen? No, I'm not. Fill us in. Yeah, I mean, this is this is uh, well known in the, mm -hmm. among, I guess, among, <laughs> among Nisho people. But uh, uh, I guess one day, uh, this was in the 1950s. And uh, um, uh, of course, at the time, uh, uh, it was uh, Kishamaru Ueshiba and, uh, and uh, uh, Tohei, Koichi Tohei, who were head uh, instructors at Hambu. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Tohei had just come back recently from uh, a trip to the US uh, where he was spreading uh, Aikido. Mm -hmm. And I guess at the time, of course, the economy in Japan was pretty, pretty poor and people didn't have very much. And Tohei had bought this nice leather jacket and uh, this is at a time when people in Japan had trouble getting shoes. And uh, so he, Tohei came in to class one night and was very upset that somebody had stolen his jacket. And uh, so this is Nisho Sensei was actually there at the time. And uh, when O Sensei uh, came in, he says, what's wrong with, what's wrong with Tohei? What's he upset about? You know, somebody told O Sensei, oh, the, you know, his jacket was stolen. 
And uh, Osensei got very upset with Tohei because uh, afterwards, uh, Nisho Sensei says, well, I followed Osensei and I asked him, like, why were you so upset with him? He says, it was his fault his jacket was stolen because you shouldn't have nice things and show them off so that other people want to steal them. Mm -hmm. So in his own actions, he created a thief. He created the opportunity for essentially, and this goes into our Budo training, he created the opportunity for the other person to do something wrong. Hmm. And so this is a very different sense of martial art training from the sense of self-defense. Hmm. And that's why you'll see me only rarely, and if then only by accident, will I use the term self-defense when referring to Aikido. Hmm. Because uh, you're really defending the other person. You're helping the other person. So Nishio Sensei's approach was, we're becoming better martial arts so that we can help this person not do a bad thing. Hmm. So if we create a situation that allows this person to strike us, to take from us, then we're the one at fault and we should take responsibility for ourselves to not allow that thing to happen. Hmm. So this is a very different view from creating a martial art that say wants to create a winner that my the value of my aikido is based on my ability to beat the other person either in a combative situation or in a um, you know in a competitive situation and sure. so this goes very much to the heart of why uh, competition i don't think competition is bad i grew up in sports you know and track and basketball and i don't think competition is a bad thing uh, people are in judo or kendo and these these are these are great things but the, the issue is that competition doesn't necessarily bring us closer to the heart of expressing what Aikido is really there to do. Uh, so it's not about self-defense so much as it's at one level protecting the other person from doing a bad thing and that and your training you should take seriously so that you can do that. Sometimes like I tell people in practice, you know, when their technique is not very good, they end up applying it too hard on the other person. <clears throat> and so they, if they do it too hard, I say, why are you making the other person suffer for your incompetence? If you're a good martial artist, you should be able to protect that person and yourself at the same time. Mm -hmm. Nishio Sensei said, if you're throwing someone, you should never throw them in a way that you can't protect them. You shouldn't throw them on their head. You should right. throw them in a way that you can protect them all the way through that because once you take control of the situation, that's your responsibility. It's your moral obligation to the other person to be able to protect that person. So you would never fling a person or throw them or, or apply a technique in a way that they're not able to receive. Sure. Yeah, having the, the, the ability or the prowess in order to uh, well, any martial artist, really, because you're talking about the ability to do harm. Really, the morality comes in into how you apply that and, and whether what level of response is justified. And uh, I guess in, in thinking back to the concept about the leather jacket, I, I think that that's uh, I ran into a, a Costa Rican friend of mine and she they, they have a, a phrase down there called uh, don't give don't give away the papaya, which is basically you don't wear opulent jewelry around in places where there are thieves and scoundrels because you are basically making yourself a target. So there's, you know, you, you yeah. basically kind of clam, camouflage yourself to blend in. But I think there's also a moral issue there too. For example, what about a woman and a woman who might get raped? Does she then mar herself or make herself ugly or have to hide that she's a woman because unlike the jacket you could just leave the jacket mm -hmm. at home or not own the jacket now how do we put that same moral template on somebody who that you know a woman who could be attacked and raped because she is exactly inherently what she is and she can't hide it or or should she have to hide that you know what i'm saying so it's an interesting nice. uh kind of rabbit hole we can we, we could go down of the you know the balance of the morality and of course um, you know, I agree. Well, your, that... moral, your, your moral obligation extends to yourself as well. Mm -hmm. 
So Aikido is, it's, you know, we, we have, um, we have scenarios where, you know, it's like a, uh, you know, a, a zero sum, you know, where you're saying I have to win or you have to win. Mm -hmm. But the ideal for Aikido, and I think this really goes to the sort of practice of Aikido, is, is it the purpose of Aikido to prepare people for self-defense situations? Is that, is that really it? If that's really the purpose of what we're doing, then our training methodology and everything that we do in terms of Aikido is, is, is really um, pointed in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. That being said, there are instructors, and this is kind of an individual thing from instructor to instructor, that have different levels of background in those particular skill sets. Mm -hmm. And they weave them into their Aikido practice in various ways. Sure. Um, not every instructor necessarily has that um, orientation. I think if you go, and you've probably been to Hambu Dojo and you train at Hambu Dojo, there's nothing about that at Hambu Dojo. Right, sure. I think, and, and I think you hit on a really strong point there, which is kind of the expectation of, of getting into violence. And, and I, I find that it, it tends to come, just the idea that it, that the, it is a zero, zero sum game, that there was one winner and one loser. And that's kind of what it seems like if the, the exposure we have to violence is through a sport or through movies or television shows, which is where most people get it. They either watch sport of some kind mm -hmm. and there is a winner and there is a loser and that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what I find as a parallel in, in the real world that all of us have experienced is either getting into an argument or participating in a negotiation where you view either I'm gonna get like, let's say you and I are negotiating over the price of a car or something. I'm gonna win if I basically cheat you out of I lower the price so far that, and I get the car for what I want to pay for it, even though I know that you're getting cheated out of the price of the uh, car. And they view negotiation in this uh, way. And, and as I studied negotiation, the, the ones who are, very, are really superior at it are the ones that make sure that the two parties, or if there's multiple parties, all of them come out winners. That's the goal of the negotiation is for it to be a win-win for everyone. And from a, <clears throat> I think right. from a, a self-defense situation, the win for, for the, the person that's being attacked is to emerge without injury, to, to not be victimized. The win that you're trying to get for the attacker is that you've immobilized them or neutralized the threat against you without having to cause harm. And, and that can happen any, any number of ways or, or the benefit can be any number of things, which is you didn't, you don't, you now no longer have to worry about your conscience and saying, did I overreact and I caused another human being harm when, you know, maybe they were drunk or maybe they were delusional or, you know, all of these things all the way up to, you know, am I not being charged with a crime? Am I not being jailed or having, you know, having myself imprisoned for overreaction? Okay. And I think that that comes yeah. down to down to measure, like what is what measure do I need to assure my safety? How can I do this with the minimal amount of physical intervention uh, possible? And um, and and so I found that as I practice negotiation, oh, here's here's a go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, what I was going to say is, I, I think you're exactly right when it comes to this sort of negotiating thing that 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 we're trying to avoid um, exploitation. You know, we're not exploiting the other person for our, just for our own gain. We're reaching some sort of mutual benefit. Um, you know, as Nishio Sensei would say, we're looking for paths of mutual coexistence. Mm -hmm. So the way that martial arts were traditionally done, if you look at Japanese martial arts from feudal time, when you drew the sword and cut, you cut to kill. Mm -hmm. You cut to cut the other person down. Mm -hmm. So, but, the, you know, the whole concept that we have in, in uh, martial art and Aikido, particularly where we emphasize Katsu Jinkin and Satsu Jinkin, you know, where we have the life preserving sword and the killing sword. Mm -hmm. So this is something that um, Nishio Sensei took very seriously. And as we study the way that he approached uh, Aikido from a technical perspective, he was actually able to manifest in stages how we can transform the sword 
from something that is specifically designed to take and, and ultimately to take life into something that's actually able to give. Mm -hmm. And he would sometimes, even though he, he, I don't think he was a Christian, that he would quote that uh, as that verse from Isaiah where he would say that in Aikido, we're bending swords into plowshares. You know, we're taking something that's normally martial art meant to hurt and kill and taking it and making it into something that's uh, there to preserve and elevate the value of life. I mean, ultimately, when you raise a weapon for your cause, and I don't mean in the terms of like a woman who's being attacked, in those situations, I say she should do whatever she needs to do in order to survive that situation. Uh, because when that other person comes to the table and they, you know, it's like when you're playing poker and you have to ante up and the other person says, well, I'm going to I'll put in so much. And if they ante up your life, you know, or your health or your survival, then you have to, then they have also uh, in a sort of um, indirectly placed themselves at the same table. And so uh, to the degree that we can, you know, somebody says, oh, does your Aikido work? For me, if I get that question, uh, my answer to that question is if the opponent is lucky. And when I, when I say that, I think that many people, especially lately, because we're sort of seeing something that I think is very good in Aikido, we're seeing a sort of democratization of Aikido, where a lot of different people are contributing in different ways. They have different backgrounds. They might have uh, you know, a military background. They might have competitive martial art background. And they're all coming to the table. And they're all saying, this is how we can sort of improve Aikido. Um, but to my way of looking at it, and I think looking at how Nisho Sensei taught and approached Aikido, oh, looks like we have a little pause here. I think we had a little glitch. Just repeat what you said in the last 10 seconds. Oh, okay. Um, I think looking at how Nisho Sensei approached Aikido. Most people that look at Aikido and trying to make improvements onto it, sort of look at it like, okay, we have these basic techniques. How can we do something to sort of add on to the technique to make it better? How can we sort of, I mean, for want of a better word, toughen it up or roughen up our Aikido a little bit? You know, how can I take that Nikkyo and really mess somebody up with it? You know, what are, what are more vicious ways that I can approach this technique? And Nisho Sensei's approach was exactly the opposite. The viciousness already happened. So when you're doing Aikido, what you're doing is you're starting from something that's already extremely brutal. And like, for example, in Nisho Sensei's Aikido, both the sword and a temi striking are absolutely central. They form the absolute central structure of every technique and every movement that you do is completely imbued with a temi. You don't move anywhere without the ability to strike the other person. So that forms the underlying structure and framework of everything. It's not that you're adding a temi onto your technique. You don't just say, oh, I'm gonna do shihonage here and I could hit you there if I wanted to. And then here's where I could also hit you here. That's a, that's a completely reversed approach to it. Every technique in Nisho Sensei's approach begins with a series of strikes. And when you're doing Iaido in terms of what we call Aiki Toho Iaido, which is his sword methodology, every technique is absolutely built on the very structure of cutting the opponent, of being able to cut the opponent, or in the sense of empty and being able to strike the opponent. That's the central structure. Mm -hmm. Then what you're doing is you're, you know, if I ask a student, why do we do Nikyo? Why do we do Sankyo? You know, to some people, they, they, thought they like those techniques because you can hurt people with them. But to this approach, we're doing Nikyo so that we don't have to strike the opponent. We're doing Sankyo and Shihonage. Those are ways of not having to strike the opponent. So the, the Aikido technique that you're doing is an attenuation of an underlying lethal situation that is total devastation to your opponent. If you approach it from that approach, then you're no longer trying to fix Aikido. So what Nishio Sensei did is he took O Sensei's words very seriously when O Sensei said, 
When I pick up a sword, my Aikido becomes a sword. When I pick up a Joe, my Aikido becomes a Joe. Okay. So when, when O Sensei said this kind of thing, what he meant was, at least in terms of Nisho Sensei's interpretation, as far as I can understand what Nisho Sensei taught. So this is through my lens, is that regardless of the source material, Aikido is not the technique, but Aikido is the method or the approach by which we transform those techniques. So you can essentially start with any source material that you want to. For me, I have some background in, in some Judo, in some Kempo, obviously I'm ranked in Iido. So those are my source material. For O Sensei, his source material was, was largely Daito Ru. And so the way that we look at Aikido today is essentially through that lens. But you could begin with, uh, you can begin with Kempo source material, you can begin with Kali as source material. You can really use anything and through the process of Aikido, transform that thing and essentially, you know, bend the sword into the plowshare and turn that into something of a very different expression. So it's not a matter of say, how can I wrangle a kodagaishi on somebody? That's ridiculous. When you see somebody step into the ring with an opponent trying to prove their Aikido, and they're trying to wrangle a kodagaishi on somebody, that is the silliest. It's not like, oh, oh, oh I gotta, gotta grab the wrist, gotta, gotta get that. That's ridiculous. That shows an, an incredible lack of understanding about what makes Aikido work. Uh, so it's not about whether, oh, if, if you see you, know, you see a video somewhere and somebody managed to, to wrangle a wrist lock on somebody, all of a sudden that's a win for Aikido. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. That's not how it works at all. Uh, so, I mean, I, <laughs> I could rant on a little bit about sure. that. But well, you know, we got, just got into a discussion uh, just yesterday on, on the Marshall side forum talking about uh, and I posed up this philosophical uh, scenario where you have an antagonist that's kind of getting up in your face. He hasn't pushed you or, or taken that, that initiation into physical violence yet, but he's starting to work himself up. Your, uh -huh. your skills of negotiating aren't working very well. You just know, right, at the base of your head, you know that he's going to, sooner or later, he's going to be taking a swing at you or or... You know, he's working himself up to that and you there, you haven't been able to find a way to escape or he's blocked your, your exit and you notice that he turns away for just a second. Do you take that opportunity knowing that violence is imminent to lay hands, initiate physical contact with him or do you wait as we as a lot of Aikido practitioners are taught, you always wait for the that attack to be initiated against you and then you respond. And I think this opens up to just the tangible part of how we train Aikido. Do we have a mindset where sometimes a situation may present itself where I have to initiate that contact? And what you described with the Atemi part, to me, that's a side of Aikido that is highly neglected, which is what happens when you are the one that, that initiates the, the exchange. Now, just from a pure strategy standpoint, we know action beats reaction. If you are counting to be reactive, you're gambling that you're going to be perceptive enough. You're gonna have good enough timing, good enough control of distance, good enough awareness, and not be essentially ambushed. The, uh, the, the sen no sen, go no sen dilemma of how, how far do you wait before you take action? Um, and, and that's why I, I totally I, agree. I, I, that, I, that, I that, never, that. I, never I, honestly, I never feel that I'm reactive. Mm-hmm. I always feel that I'm creating, I am participating in creating a mutual situation. So once you and the other person are engaged, you're engaged in real time. I never feel that I'm waiting and asking them to make the first, the first move. I always right. feel that I'm actively, essentially, um, the feeling of like attacking the attack. Mm -hmm. So I'm never just waiting or seeing if I can grab something. Sure. That's, that's a silly approach. Um, mm -hmm. If you understand how to um, how to take the correct position mm -hmm. relative to the opponent, 
this is the first step. If you look at Nisho Sensei's book, it's called, and we'll talk about two concepts because in the title of his book, the title of his book is called Aikido Yurusu Budo, the Irimi Isoku process, or the Irimi Isoku principle rather. So let's talk about, we'll talk about two different concepts. We'll talk about Yurusu, which is sort of Nishio Sensei's nickname for Aikido. Um, and then we'll talk about Irimi because both of those concepts explain the philosophical and explain the technical approach because that's the two questions that we're really trying to answer with Aikido. We have a philosophical ideal, we have a technical challenge. So the technical challenge that, that, uh, that Nishio Sensei answered was the problem of how do you not get punched in the face? And that's a good one because once that happens, as Mike Tyson has said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Exactly. If that so, lands, if so that succeeds, you're in trouble. You're done. And, and, and nothing philosophical, no ideals will happen at that point. You cannot get punched in the face and you cannot control that situation by adopting some sort of special puerile state of mind. You can't control that situation by, you know, by, by being idealistic about it. It's, it's a real physical situation that you have to address at that moment. You can't just be blissful or extend some kind of feeling to the other person and expect that situation to go well. Mm -hmm. It will not. Okay. So the Irimi principle is, is, is a very involved principle. But essentially, it starts with the first step. When you approach the opponent, you have to move to a position where you can strike without being hit yourself. And you have to maintain that position at every single point in your technique. Every single step, every single movement that you make has to maintain your eating position on the opponent so that you can strike them at any moment, at any point in your technique without, being, without them being able to strike you. This comes out of an understanding of sword. When you're dealing with striking arts, you can sort of toughen yourself up a little bit. You can, you know, and you can, you can take a hit, right? Okay, so we can do, but when you're dealing with a blade, it doesn't matter how tough you are, you're gonna get cut just the same. You know, everybody's carotid artery is about that far under the skin here. Once you get cut there, it doesn't matter how strong you are. So the idea of strength is very different when it comes to the sword. So when we pick up the sword and we do Aikido Huiai, which is Nisho Sensei's um, a sword method, which, which directly relates to Aikido. And I know Saito Sensei has a sword method that also relates to Aikido. But the difference is, and let me sidebar this a little bit, is that Nisho Sensei went and trained himself with very high ranking uh, Iaido teachers in Japan, around Tokyo area there where he lived. And these were people who were, you know, eighth, ninth dawn people. When Nishio Sensei first went to Hamu Dojo, he, he had heard that Aikido was based on sword, but he didn't see any evidence of it. It wasn't, nobody would pick up a sword and show that this is, uh, this is how these things connect. Mm -hmm. Then the first time that he actually saw a Sensei demonstrate Aikido, Oh, sensei picked up the sword, boom, 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 boom. Oh, sensei picked up the joe, boom, 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 boom. Then oh, sensei left, and then we're back to doing the regular thing that they did before. And he said, well, what happened to the sword? Can somebody at Hambu here explain to me where the sword is in Aikido? And, there, and he wasn't getting any good answers. So he took the, the initiative himself to start going and training. And Ishinru, so Shindinru, so he took it up, you know, so, so that what we're doing in in terms of Nishio Sensei's Aikido is a correct use of the sword. It's not a sort of hybrid kind of let's work backward from Aikido techniques kind of thing. We begin with correct and proper use of the Japanese sword. How to hold the sword, how to draw the sword, how to cut, how to receive the sword. That is an essential understanding and every student begins that in day one. They all begin with weapons. It's not an advanced thing. It's central to understand sword and understand a temi from day one. From, from the first two or three days with, 
uh, with a student, they are already learning how to move properly into position and control the Edimi position. So back to Edimi, Edimi comes out of sword because in sword, you have to move in such a way that you can't sort of trade strikes. You can't have the Ayuchi situation. Right. You have to strike the other person without being hit yourself. So when you move relative to the other person, it's this half step movement where as you're facing the opponent, many people in Aikido, they, they hold their feet this, right? This, mm -hmm. this is Hanmi, right? Mm -hmm. But this is not Nisho Sensei's foot position. Nisho Sensei's foot position is here. This is the facing the opponent, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Then when the opponent We lost you at when the opponent, when the opponent, okay. your so camera froze again. You're bisecting the opponents. Oh, I'll say, sorry. Yeah, you froze up right oh, after you say when the opponent and you had your hands up. So just repeat the last like 15 seconds. Okay. 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 Right, right. So, so when the opponent, when you're facing the opponent, rather than standing this way, you stand with your feet this way. So your feet are slightly turned in. This is the opponent, right? So then when the opponent moves, if I'm here and I move on you right this way, the center line changes and I'm shifting. You'll see the same thing in boxing. When you throw a jab in boxing, you don't throw it like this way, right? What do you do when you throw a jab in boxing? You shift as you hit, right? You shift as you hit. You don't leave your face right there because as soon as you come back, you're gonna get hit in the face. So you shift as you're, as you're throwing the strike. So when you're moving in Edimi, in the Edimi movement is this movement where you're moving about 30 degrees to the opponent and you're able to strike here and you'll find, which is difficult to demonstrate over video, that at that moment that I hit you, you, your, all of your strikes will be about four to five inches away from my face. Mm -hmm. You right. will not be able to hit me. And it's essential when you move that way. So a lot of people in it, I, you know, they think of in, early on in my training, my pre nicio days, I thought of eating me as moving in. Mm -hmm. You know, let's, let's move toward the opponent. Eating me with is the idea of moving. Nisho Sensei, it's not that way. If you're standing in the street and a car is coming towards you, do you A, run toward the car, B, run away from the car, or C, move toward the curb? Mm -hmm. So all of Nisho Sensei's Edimi movements are exactly to the side. That's, that's what we call Edimi. It's, Edimi is not, you know, we say Edimi meaning enter. It's not the idea of going forward like you're going through a door. That's just, you know, you're gonna get you're gonna get punched right in the face. It's this idea of moving at this angle so that you're controlling the short line between you and the opponent, and every other line between you and the opponent is longer, meaning the opponent is outreached. That's how you win in sword. Mm -hmm. When you move into this angle, you know, watch that famous scene. Uh, from the Seven Samurai, where the uh, that kind of cocky guy wants to take on the master swordsman out in the field there, mm -hmm. and they do it first with their bamboo, and right. then he says, "Oh, I won." He says, "No, you didn't." And the other ones are sitting on the side, going like, oh, "This guy's gonna die," you know, yeah. dead man walking. So they go back, and he insists on doing it with real swords. Mm -hmm. So watch carefully that that uh, that is the master swordsman and how he moves there. It's he moves boom like that way. <laughs> And the other and the guy, you know, falls over dead. Yeah. So this is the central concept, and that's why it's in the title of Nisho Sensei's book. So from a technical standpoint, now as you move through the technique, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of technical detail here because it would take us a long time. Mm -hmm. But essentially, every step as you move through Irimi, Tenkan, uh, Shikodachi, Zenkutsudachi, every every step in the technique is essentially built around this pattern of movement. Mm -hmm. And at, at every point, you have to be able to demonstrate that you can, you can strike the opponent. And not only that, but at every point in the technique, you have teiwaza, koshiwaza, ashiwaza. The way your feet move are also sweeps. Mm -hmm. The way your hips are moving are also hip throws. The way your hands are moving are, of course, the hand techniques. So at any point in the technique, you can you can respond at any level in the technique and you can strike the opponent at every point. The Kodagai Shi, I'm just using that technique as an example, sure. is way later. 
That's, that's how you finish it up. That's the way you say, this is a nice way to wrap the technique up. Do we understand each other? Mm -hmm. Just like when you see us finish in Nisho Aikido, when you see us finish with Kendai Ken, practicing Volkan versus Volkan, right? Mm -hmm. You see us finish, we'll go here, and then we'll just hold the sword right in front of the person. Mm -hmm. But when Nisho Sensei would say, you, you know, you'd have the blade right here, right? Nisho Sensei would say, you know, at this point, you're saying, are we okay? Mm -hmm. That's the conclusion of an Aikido technique. Mm -hmm. Are we okay? Are we good? Then you let them go on their way. Okay, which takes us to the other side of our conversation. If I go back to Nisho Sensei's book and the title of his book, Yurusu. This is this Japanese word that's uh, really interesting. Uh, it means to pardon or to accept or forgive. Like if you get pulled over by a police officer because you're you know, going too fast or something, and, uh, and he says, uh, okay, well, just, you know, make sure you drive carefully. Go, you know, mm. go on. That's your Rusu. Your Rusu is a sense of pardoning or forgiving somebody, even though the person has done some violation. So this is the sort of humanistic expression of Aikido. Now, to get to that point, you had to control all the other elements of Budo. So you have to have, you have to be fully competent in terms of Budo in order to express Aikido at that level. You can't just get there with a good feeling. Mm -hmm. okay? So when you look at Yurusu and say, what does it mean? It means to pardon, to forgive, to accept, to excuse. Mm -hmm. uh, as Nisho Sensei said, it's very difficult to forgive people, especially when they violated you. We all have that feeling that we want to uh, retaliate or want to you know, have some sort of retribution. But if people fight that way, they'll never stop fighting. If somebody does something wrong to you and you fight them and then they'll go call their cousin and their cousin will come and they will go on. This feud will never end. The only way uh, to further your cause is to rehumanize your opponent. And essentially traditional martial art in the sense of feudal martial art was a dehumanizing effect. The brutalities of not only Japanese culture, but all cultures, US culture. Look at it, look at our own history of dehumanizing people so that we could take their land or use them as slaves. All of the things that we've done to people, we have our own history. So we have our own reconciliation that we need to do regarding our history and how we've we've been. Mm -hmm. And so I think Aikido speaks deeply philosophically to the heart of this rehumanization. And it's expressed through our Budo. Can you always do this? Is it always possible? You know, does an individual always have the skill uh, to be able to express this in, a, in, in every situation? I don't know. It's like asking somebody who's a Christian, is love always possible? Does it always work? And you go like, they go, I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes you die for the cause. Sometimes the cause is bigger than yourself. And so you commit yourself to an ideal, uh, even if it seems like another approach might win you in the short term. Uh, so I think when we, when we wanna look at healing people and healing the world, which is what Aikido really promises to do, it can't be done unless you find ways of uh, accepting, you know, this word Yurusu and forgiving people. Uh, and our, our practice of Aikido isn't just, you know, the, the dojo is not just a, uh, a, a gym. You don't call it a gym. It's not some sort of paramilitary training compound. That's not what a dojo is. We use that word that comes from something that was uh, historically used to describe places of, of uh, sacred places that might be used for prayer and purification. We use that word because the dojo is a place where we create something special. And so in Aikido, when we get together and practice Aikido, we are not just training like an athlete to win individual victories in terms of you know, an athletic pursuit is more of an individualistic thing. How can I collect enough, you know, how can I develop enough toughness, enough stamina, 
on a personal skill so that I can beat an opponent and show my skill and rise to the top as a competitor. In Aikido, we're creating Aikido. We, every time you go to the dojo and you train with your partners, you are mutually creating Aikido together. Um, and it's, it, so it's not just whether or not you can beat your opponents, but you, Uke Nage, that relationship there is tracing a path, you know, Keiko, Keiko, you know, revisiting the old, right? Tracing a path back toward the expression of Aikido. It's something that we do, not just for ourselves as individuals, but we do it as an expression of what can make for an ideal society. And I think if you go back and you reread many things that Osensei said, uh, that you'll see that he was really looking more for creating a, a kind of ideal world for people. And Aikido was a way of reconciling and transforming something that he loved, which was Budo, reconciling it to a broader view of the world that we actually want to live in. Not in a world where everybody shoots each other on their front porch to protect their can of beans, but in a world where people get along with each other and cooperate with each other and look out for each other. That's how society, that's how humans can survive, you know, as a human family. So when we practice together, we're practicing that in a vigorous way. It's a, a vigorous conversation that we have with each other in practice. That doesn't mean it can't be tough and strong and you can't push the edges of that. And certainly as my students get stronger and advanced, I push them in ways that newer students may not be able to get pushed, but we're pushing it in the spirit of, of, of attaining to that ideal so that we can express it at deeper and deeper levels. Sure, you know, as you talked about that, I'm reminded of, of even back as far as Plato and Socrates, as strong as they were in the philosophical realm, they were like Plato was an outstanding wrestler. Like he was a, a very big, powerful uh, grappler. And their view was that if you did not have that strong physical developed side and not to, not to, I won't get, I can't get too deep into what their view on the physical aspect was because we just don't know that much about it. Whereas their, their philosophical stuff was much more, much better documented, but they clearly acknowledge the balance between the morality and the philosophical side of a person and their physical ability. They said, you cannot have one be healthy and the other one diseased or the other yes. one missing or damaged or, you know, harmful. Um, you can be the smartest guy in the world, but if your body is weak and, and you have no ability to, uh, to have that physical strength, your mind will not be as strong. And the, and the reverse is true as well. Um, and of course, when you have a strong body and high level of prowess with no philosophy or morality, now you're just a monster. And so that's, mm -hmm. they felt that was as harmful to the world as an intellect without the ability to, you know, protect themselves, their family, you know, et cetera. And so I, I can see though that, that link, that very strong link there. Um, of course, I don't, I don't believe that they were very strong with the religious side, which a sensei was. Um, but clearly the philosophy of how we live in a peaceful world, uh, I think rings true throughout ages. This has occurred to many, many wise men throughout and women throughout the history of time, you know, in period. So, um, one thing I did want to cover before we wrap up here and we're coming up on an hour, but, uh, you mentioned oh. during our call about, uh, Nishio's focus on Aikido going into the future. And I tried to go look this quote up this morning because I've run across it a couple of times, but it eluded me. It's one of Osensei's um, less co common quotes, but he talked about how he only just started into the innovations. And he felt like even when he approached his death that he was still, he still considered himself like a beginner. And there was much farther for Aikido to go. And as you mentioned about Saito, and I, and I think a lot of people in the, in the Aikido world feel like it's a, a frozen in time, set in stone uh, canon, which cannot be innovated any further or improved anymore or developed beyond where it is. And I think that I, I'm intrigued by Nishio's perspective on, on that. How do we evolve into the future? How do we keep 
changing and improving improving Aikido rather than just you know capturing it in 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 a block of ice and not letting it change. Um, so if you could well, I think at this point that. I'll mention I'll mention my current teacher. Uh, Koji Yoshida Sensei in Toyama, who Nisho Sensei appointed as one of his uh, successors. Uh, when Nisho Sensei, uh, Nisho Sensei last came to the U.S. in uh, 2000, hmm. and on that visit, uh, Yoshida Sensei was with him, and he appointed Yoshida Sensei as his successor here to to the okay. U.S. and several other countries. And so, um, since that time, Yoshida Sensei has in his own practice, and then me in my own ways as well, have innovated tremendously. I mean, Yoshida Sensei has expanded most notably the, uh, the sword uh, work that Nishio Sensei began. So when you look at Nishio Sensei's use of the sword in Aikito Horiaido, you're seeing a tremendous uh, expansion of understanding of, of that, at least, <laughs> uh, I, I think Nishio Sensei had a, 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 an enormous understanding of it, um, but Yoshida Sensei has elucidated those teachings and made them much more understandable. I understand that most people, when they first look at Nishio Sensei's work, when they look at his Ken and Joe and Iaido work, it's, it's very difficult to completely understand what he's saying with those movements. You have to be in a way um, sort of initiated into some understanding about, uh, you know, when you see this, see this uh, calligraphy, this is Yoshida Sensei wrote this. Uh, you look at this level of calligraphy writing versus what you would see at a basic level like Kaisho, right? The basic block form of, of, uh, of uh, Shoto. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the Kai show is easy to read. You know, it's uh, what a little kid would learn. You know, when you first learn to write. Mm -hmm. uh, but this level of of writing, uh, sometimes like if you make a character and you you want to go like make a shape like this way, right? But you when you write Kai show, you just make that um, shape like literally like the, every piece of it, right? But when Nishio Sensei was moving, sometimes you, you know, like when you look at uh, Yoshio, like high level uh, uh, Shoto, the, the brush comes off the page <laughs> and then comes back. So, you know, when you look at the stroke, you might see this part and you might see this part over here, but you didn't see all that other part that brought you to that part. But in your mind's eye, you see what that, person writing it, they see the feeling and you feel the, you see the stroke order and you see the direction of the brush and you can, you can see what was being written there. But this is a very high level expression of feeling and sort of more spiritual level of writing, right? So some of the things you look at with, with Nishio Sensei were almost at that level. I think what Yoshida Sensei has done since then is he's brought it to a level where most of us can start to understand it better. And so, and that's not as widely known. In fact, even Nisho Sensei, Sensei himself, he traveled a lot in Europe. He would go uh, over to Denmark um, and uh, other places in France and he would come to California, but he didn't really go anywhere else in the United States. So you don't see many people in the US practicing uh, this, this approach. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful approach. You don't have to be a tough guy. It, you don't have to be brutal, but it's just enormously effective. Um, and uh, so I think what we've seen in terms of evolution since Nisho Sensei's passing has been enormous. And uh, I'm certainly continuing through my own endeavors and teaching and uh, through my students and my dojo to evolve uh, and keeping to the spirit of Aikido and at the same time, uh, bringing in other understandings that I have from my martial art background and other students. Many of my students are martial artists from other arts that come to train with me. And many of them are former and current military. And uh, I kind of live in an area here that's near Pendleton uh, uh, Marine Base here. So, uh, uh, you know, we get, uh, we get quite a few people that are uh, paramilitary, military, uh, law enforcement, those kind of people. So I have some background in 
in uh, tactical training, things like that, and some familiarity. So, um, but uh, as I said, when we first started talking, I think it's wonderful that so many people are experimenting in different directions and, uh, and sort of finding an Aikido that works for them. Nisho Sensei was adamant that Aikido should not stay the same. He says, you know, you should make, and you should, and, and even said once that you should look in your own culture. You shouldn't necessarily be bounded by some kind of Japanese culture, that you should look to your own history. You should look to your own roots. So, you know, and many times I'll look at boxing technique and boxing has some applications, but it also has some limited, um, uh, you know, when it comes to tr translating between something that involves having big, you know, pillows on your hands, you can function in a way here that really, you know, when you look at the old empty hand, like bare knuckle guys, these people fight like this way and not like this way. Well, there's a reason, you know, when you have big right. pillows in your hand, this works, but if you're going to block any kind of a strike, this is not going to cover anything. So this position right becomes less meaningful when it comes to an empty hand situation. So, so you have to look at what you're drawing from and make sure that it sort of translates in a way that's meaningful to the practice that you're doing. Sure. And that it arrives at some conclusion that uh, expresses uh, your, or that allows you the ability to forgive and release the opponent. Sure. That's essentially the expression of Aikido. That's what makes Aikido Aikido. So Aikido is an Aikido because you did Ikkyo on somebody or because you did Shihonagi on something. That's not, a, that's not what makes it Aikido. You know, Aikido has to do with um, your ability to uh, contain the situation, to control the situation, and then subsequently to release the other person and release them from, uh, you know, to forgive. In a, in a sense, and uh, and that's a deep message that I think, as we practice Aikido, in a kind of, uh, uh, you know, the alchemists would do, you know, experiments. It's a sort of alchemical process that, through that process of doing this experiment and doing this activity here, I'm also affecting something within my own spirit, within my own soul. You know, if I practice being a bad person, if I practice hurting people all the time that's gonna affect who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. So when you look at when Osensei said, Aikido is not for correcting other people, it's for correcting yourself. Mm -hmm. So always look at your Aikido practice as how is this making me a, a better person? How is this creating a kind of um, misogi for my soul? You know, how is it improving my state of mind and by extension, other people who participate in this practice? Is it making them better in their families? Is it making them better in their relationships with their coworkers? Is it making them a better dad or a better mom? You know, just a better human being. Um, or at least is it helping them find a pathway that's consistent with being that person? It never interested me ever in martial arts, finding new ways of hurting people. That's not, I think you have to be some kind of a sociopath. There's, there's something wrong with a person who wants to spend, for me, I mean, gosh, how many years? 40, started in the mid 70s there. How many years would I spend finding new ways to hurt people? <laughs> sure. I, well, I, would have I, to be I do think that, with... that when, if people believe that that's what martial arts is and they have that very simplistic view of it, then they can be drawn into a salesman who will say, I'm, I will, you pay me and I will train you in many, many ways to hurt people. Yes. And, and that, that's an easy thing to, to deliver. It's very easy to hurt, hurt people. Um, it's harder to protect yourself by not hurting them and to control yes. them. Control is a much, yeah. much more difficult uh, thing. And that's why, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that I cover with, with my students a great deal of the time is say, you, you may be faced with a situation that is beyond your skill level. Like that could happen. It might happen that you, in order to save yourself, might have to injure somebody or, or cause them pain just because you're, you're overwhelmed, like you're, you're beyond your ability level. I mean, we all have that ivy, ivory tower ideal where we want to be so skilled that we will never be in a situation which is beyond our training or ability. And it'd be nice if, that, if it happened that way. Um, I'm not saying that situation will never happen. 
Sure. Here, here's how I will describe this to you. Mm -hmm. If you get in a situation, you or me or anybody gets in a situation where they're overwhelmed by the situation and they end up doing whatever they can mm -hmm. with broken bottles and, and, mm -hmm. and sticks to defend themselves, then that's what you needed to do to survive at that moment. It's not Aikido though. Right. So let's just agree that it's not that. Now, maybe you needed to do that to protect your family, to protect yourself, or to, you know, for some other, for some other reason. But we can, we, can, we can at least agree that that was not Aikido getting accomplished right there. So we don't necessarily have to reconcile that situation to the ideal of what it is that we're attempting to accomplish through Aikido. Aikido is, it's a path, you know, it's a dough, you're working toward this. So when, you know, and I know this isn't some debate, the meaning of Budo, you know, the idea of stopping the spear, and there's some etymological discussions around, does that really mean stop the spear, or whatever, but Nishio Sensei sort of took it to mean that Budo was a practice of the way to stop the opponent's weapon. Um, at least that was the, the meaning that was uh, popular at the time. Mm. And what he would say was that the practice of Aikido is not how to stop the opponent's weapon, but how to stop your own weapon. Mm. It's a way to keep your own weapon. He says the true place for the sword is in the Saya. Mm. If you finish the technique with the sword back in your Saya with no blood on it, then that's Aikido. Mm. <clears throat> okay. So it's not necessarily about how do I control that other person. It's to the degree I was able to <clears throat> restrain my own violent tendencies in that situation is the degree to which I successfully accomplished Aikido. Mm -hmm. If I give sway to my own violent tendencies or my own tendencies to want vengeance or some other thing, then that's the degree to which Aikido was not accomplished in that situation. So we might have varying degrees of success mm -hmm. <laughs> depending on the situation, but it doesn't mean that the ideal is somehow uh, not, not still held um, <clears throat> you know, as our ideal. How did, how did that reconcile with, with those sensei's statement about uh, <laughs> when he was asked to, to perform a demonstration for the emperor's representative and he said, I can't yeah. demonstrate Aikido because true Aikido would end up with my attacker dead or severely injured. So what my, the, any demonstration I presented to you would be a lie and I don't wanna lie. I don't wanna pre present a falsehood. And that was the story where uh, his attacker, he actually broke the attacker's arm and, and uh, I think it was Gozo Shioda had to step in and be, be uh, uke for the, for the rest of the, the demonstration. Um, because I think that 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 description of Aikido being capable of killing, and in fact a likelihood of of killing or causing serious harm, I think uh, is an interesting one posed with the with the, the description of Aikido that you just described. The the truth of the matter always lies, as one of my students always says to me. He goes, "When I'm when I'm facing you, and here's a guy who actually." Um, uh, uh, has a huge karate background, did full contact training and everything, was a, a student actually of Fumio Demora. And whenever he's facing me in practice and we're training together, he goes, I always get the sense that at the center of your technique is total devastation. <laughs> yep. And there is, there's always a sense, you know, like uh, I say rather impolitely sometimes, when the opponent faces you, <clears throat> they should crap themselves just a little bit. Mm. They should feel that there's, there's something meaningful there. It does annoy me somewhat when I see people doing demonstrations and facing opponent and not treating the opponent seriously. Sort of like Great. moving in a way that, you know, you have to treat this. It's disrespectful to face an opponent and not treat them seriously. Oh, you, yeah. have to, you have to look at them and go like, there's... There is some there is some consequences to what's about to happen, and I have to take that very seriously, even in practice, even when we're enjoying practice and we're smiling and we might be, you know, having a good time. There's still this sense that there's seriousness at the core of this all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pretend I know what was in Osensei's mind or where he was at in terms of his own development with this. 
I actually don't necessarily feel that in order for Aikido to be um, uh, true for me, that I need to necessarily always, um, uh, how do I say this in a, in a kind of tactful way, that, that I always need to necessarily think about what would O Sensei think or do all sure. the time. He was a man. I think he had some important insights. I think he set the stage for a development and uh, to and 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 presented questions to us that needed to be addressed. That the idea of violence and the use of power, whether it's physical power or the you know exploitation through physical or economic or whatever power that you have in the world. This is something that we need to address in order to, you know, exploiting the environment. How, how long can we keep exploiting the environment and not suffer as a, as a species in doing that? So all of these questions of power and exploitation don't just happen when two people face each other in a, in a combative situation. Power and exploitation questions run through every, you know, every part of the human condition. And they all, you know, the, our ability to kind of face these questions and answer them in a broader sense in Aikido can really perhaps shed light on how we can approach them on a broader, you know, national or global scale. Sure. Cool. Well, this has been a great discussion. Is there anything uh, you want to wrap up with uh, pointing to the, uh, your website, your dojo, uh, make people aware of some of the projects you're working on? Yeah, we, we have, um, there are a couple websites if you want to get um, more information and we do have a, uh, we actually have a video site that we run that's a little subscription site, kind of like a, uh, like a, like a Netflix site, uh, you know, TV site uh, for, and our, uh, I'll say this about organizations, um, I happen to be the president of what's called Nishikaze uh, Aikido Association and, and uh, with Nishikaze, we started this organization. Uh, I didn't start it myself, actually. Yoshida Sensei uh, instructed us to start this uh, organization after Nisho Sensei uh, passed away as a way to keep our relationship with uh, Hamu Dojo. And so um, that that is kind of our organization. I'm not a huge fan of necessarily hierarchical structures within Aikido. I'm mm -hmm. much more a fan of, uh, of democratization of, of structures. Um, I think uh, I think that's a, a more enlightened approach to the world. I understand that we respect our teachers, and I certainly have the senpai and the teachers that came before me, and we hold them in in esteem. But also, we are individuals, and we have our own uh, our own lives and our own uh, way of seeing the world, and and that should be uh, looked at and respected as as well. So uh, I'm not about creating uh, any kind of organization that people need to to, to join up or anything like that. Sure. We just simply did that kind of as our as our own thing. Um, that being said, you can go to Nishikaze <clears throat> means West Wind. Uh, Nishikaze Aikido uh, org. That is our association website. On there, you'll see a link to our uh, TV site. On there, you'll find a little membership. You can get a free trial on it and just check it out. There's many videos of uh, not only uh, Nishio Sensei uh, and training vi videos that we have there, you know, things that we've collected over the years. Uh, also uh, of Yoshida Sensei, there's a great collection of Yoshida Sensei uh, and myself breaking down huge numbers of clips of various techniques uh, instructionally on there. Uh, if you want to look at my dojo's website, it's greenwoodaikido.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and on there, you can just see me and kind of see a picture of our outdoor dojo here in Southern California, where fortunately it's pretty nice almost all year long. Nice. So, yeah. You know, I, I do think that, and I agree with you about the hierarchical organization thing. Um, too many times organizations, even within an art such as Aikido or karate or anything, view each other as competitors, like our Aikido is superior to theirs. It, isn't it ironic that Aikido that talks about not competing is seems to get stricken by the same thing and I, I do think the answer to that is like what you talk about I refer to it as an open source model where 
each person just chooses mentors and, and, and to gather what they think, what they feel works for them. Try out new things from different people. Uh, the more you travel and get exposure to other perspectives and other views, you'll find things that fit your own personality and your own art really well. I don't think, uh, you know, the, the practice of saying, well, that's not Aikido or this isn't Aikido or that's not Aikido and bickering about it really goes anywhere other than just to create animosity and, and conflict. And I think that that's, we're trying to overcome that conflict and overcome the animosity. Let's find what works and have it evolve. So that's why I was so eager to, to talk about Nisho's perspectives and because and I like what I what you told me about his mind for the future, the mind for evolution, you know, all under the, the umbrella of an Aiki approach, but not stuck in a place where the tools are, are static, where they are, where they, they never evolve or change. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So I, my, my encouragement to everyone out there that's innovating and trying new things and, and please do look at, at what we're doing in, in, uh, in terms of what Nisho Sensei laid out. And I describe it that way as well. I describe it like he gave us an operating system. Mm -hmm. He was always insistent that we don't just keep repeating the same thing that we did before and show up at class. You know, when you look at, uh, look at any practice, it's just a window in. Look at Ikkyo. You know, we, there's a reason we call it Ikkyo and not Ichiwaza. Mm -hmm. It's not a technique. It's no, I, I say, look, you never just go up to somebody and just put an Ikkyo on them. You know, you never just put... Ikkyo is a, is a window into a study of a particular context. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily something that you would literalize. Mm -hmm. So Aikido provides this framework. And I think we can all kind of agree there's the framework. And now we can use that framework as a window into various um, avenues of study and ways of exploring ideas and bringing in other things. And like we talked about sort of democratizing the process, open sourcing the process, and at the same time, maybe agreeing in a sort of sense of, um, you know, what is our, what is the basic constitution of Aikido? You know, what are these truths that we hold to be self-evident? <laughs> there you go. This, the principle, this is the, this is the guiding star here that we're all going to kind of rally toward and we might debate here and there over what that comma really means and, you know, the, the specifics of it. And we'll yeah, we bring those, bring, we... bring the lawyers in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so. But at least we know we're all kind of roughly headed in, right. in that direction. And I think that's something we can all agree on regardless of uh, what we find uh, through our own uh, through our own explorations. So. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Philip. This has been a great conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tristan, for having me on. My best to everyone out there as well. Please uh, stay safe and uh, my best to everyone. Thank you so much. You bet. Take care. Thank you very much for watching and supporting this podcast. Enjoy your training.